welcome to a new Getting to Know Japan webinar. Thank you for joining us and a big thank you to our program sponsor, the Japan Foundation New York, for funding this series and enabling us to put this on each week. Today, we are joined by Dr. Stephen Nagy, who will be presenting on Japan-China relations. Dr. Stephen Nagy received his PhD in International Relations from Waseda University in 2008. His main affiliation is as professor at the International Christian University in Tokyo. He has many think tank affiliations, and he is a frequent political, economic, and security commentator on Japan, China, Korea, and U.S. relations in Japanese and international media outlets, such as the New York Times, the BBC, CNN, the Japan Times, just to name a few. To read Dr. Nagy's full biography and to learn more about his research projects, we welcome you to visit our website. So Dr. Nagy, it is a pleasure to have you with us here today. I'll let you take it from here. Thanks very much, Amani. And yes, um, this evening we're going to talk about Japan-China relations. And on the first anniversary of the, path, uh, of the uh, death of Prime Minister uh, Shinzo Abe, I hope to bring in a dimension uh, of how he considered uh, and uh, engaged in this very consequential relationship. Um, Amani, can we go to our PowerPoint slide, please? Thank you. Uh, and we can go to the next slide. Thank you. So in terms of the structure of today's presentation, what I'd like to do is um, try to convey to you at least four different ways to understand Japan-China relations through, I think, four useful books. Uh, I'd like to touch upon the future of Japan-China relations. And lastly, what I'm going to do is just uh, reflect upon how I understood uh, the late Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's contribution to bilateral relations, uh, which I think is very important for us to be thinking about um, as uh, the US-China strategic competition continues to deepen and how countries like Japan under the leadership of leaders like Prime Minister Abe negotiated this very complex dynamic. Can we go to the next slide, please? So I think it's useful for us to, as we engage in uh, looking at Japan-China relations, is to think about it at least in terms of these four books. Of course, there's many different books that have been written about this important bilateral relationship. But why I chose these uh, different uh, books is that they present different aspects of uh, Japan-China relations over a historical period of time. Uh, the first one is Ezra Vogel's book on China and Japan facing history. Uh, the second is The Middle Kingdom and the Empire of the Sun by June Tofel Dreyer. The third is A Superb Read by Rana Mitter, a China historian on China's war with Japan from 1937 to 1945. And lastly is Asia's Reckoning, talking about the trilateral relationship between China, Japan, and the United States. Now, what's interesting about these four books is they really look at the bilateral relations, relationships differently. Um, the first book by um, Ezra Vogel, really uh, one of the most uh, prominent um, China-Japan historians, uh, looks at the relationship basically from the Tang Dynasty, so that's back in the 8th century, all the way up to the contemporary times. And I think the cr critical themes that we can take home from uh, Ezra Vogel's book is that these two countries, um, well, China used to be Japan's teacher um, 1,200 years ago. Uh, and then what we saw is a long period of isolation between these two states. And then in the late 19th century, as Japan modernized, westernized very quickly and was able to push back against um, uh, the European uh, imperial powers and protect its sovereignty and its independence, we saw uh, China fall to uh, the European powers, that Japan became the leading nation within the region. And at that particular time, uh, the Chinese, uh, in an effort to uh, self-strengthen and uh, to uh, repel uh, imperial powers, decided to learn from Japan. And what we saw from the late uh, 19th century, really up until um, 19, the 1930s, is that uh, many, many, many uh, Chinese intellectuals, students, uh, as well as other officials from China, uh, whether it was the Qing dynasty or the Republican dynasty, uh, come to Japan to try to learn how to modernize uh, and westernize aspects of its economy, its 
political system and of course its military so that it could uh, survive and negotiate the challenges of colonialism that they were experiencing. So during this period, uh, despite the challenges of the bilateral relationship, we saw that the Japanese looked to China as an economic opportunity. They saw tremendous potential in fusing and working together with uh, China to build a, a, an empire. Um, and this uh, view about China eventually led to, of course, uh, uh, Japan in the, uh, occupying Manchuria, setting up a puppet state, and eventually leading to war. Uh, on the Chinese side, again, they went, they visited Japan, they looked to Japan as a teacher and looked how they modernized successfully to maintain their traditions, uh, but at the same time, modernized their economy so that they could compete effectively with, um, with the Western powers. Um, this book eventually uh, tilts to the war uh, uh, between the two states from 1937 to 1945 and touches upon, of course, the brutality of Japan in China, uh, whether it's the Nanjing massacre or the uh, 731 uh, uh, live experiments on, um, uh, on Chinese citizens um, and the efforts of the Japanese to create uh, an empire within the region. Um, following the surrender of the Japanese to the United States, we see uh, Ezra Vogel talk about how these two states uh, started to re-engage with each other after the normalization of bilateral relations in the early 70s under Prime Minister uh, Tanaka Kakue and uh, then leader Mao Zedong. Uh, from the 1970s onward, uh, again, this was a period where the Chinese learned from the Japanese in terms of how to modernize their economy, how to uh, create a manufacturing uh, networks within uh, China. And eventually, again, this uh, view of Japan as a teacher uh, continued really up until uh, the 2000s. And privately, I think that uh, many uh, Chinese would acknowledge that Japan still plays a tremendous role in China today in terms of development, the provision of technology uh, and investment at many different levels. And Ezra Vogel finishes his book in terms of talking about the bilateral relations as today, uh, Japan losing some vitality associated with the two decades of stagnation, um, uh, demographics, and really uh, a more inward looking Japan in many ways, uh, that China could be in some ways a teacher of, for Japan in terms of how to uh, have a more vibrant society, to be more competitive, to be a more upwardly mobile. And uh, Ezra Vogel um, ends his book in saying that today, uh, these two countries and these two important neighbors need to learn from each other to be able to coexist, but also to find prosperity uh, moving forward. Um, the second book was a little bit uh, similar in terms of looking at the, the um, bilateral relations. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dreyer uh, looks at the Middle Kingdom and the Empire of the Rising Sun from the viewpoint is that Japan has always had a very selective engagement with China over the centuries. And she highlights in the Tang Dynasty that the Japanese uh, had a pick and choose approach to which Chinese culture they imported into Japan and eventually localized uh, to meet the Japanese conditions. And she very much touches upon that once the Tang Dynasty collapsed, Japan uh, retreated into an area, uh, a, a period of isolation and very selective engagement with the Chinese, uh, viewing China as both an opportunity but a potential challenge and that um, they felt that uh, the best way to uh, retain strategic autonomy was to uh, maintain as much uh, uh, distance from uh, the various Chinese emp uh, empires as possible. Uh, again, her main, main conclusion, it really is, is that this relationship was one of, uh, in which uh, Japan selected what cultures and the kind of engagement that it was going to uh, sustained with the Chinese very much up until the end of the 19th century when uh, Japan modernized very quickly and decided to engage in China as an incredible economic, economic opportunity moving forward. Um, her book, uh, I think, is a very different take than uh, some of the common Chinese narratives that really Japan was a kind of a vassal state that imported most of its culture from China and didn't really have any uh, independence. Uh, and I think that uh, her research definitely shows that this relationship has always been complicated. Um, it's always been selective and that both sides see each other 
uh, very, very differently than I think the reality. Um, the third book, which is a fantastic read, and I do encourage you to uh, look at any of Rana Mitra's books, but this book in particular, China's War with uh, Japan, another often, uh, an another title for this book is called The Forgotten Ally, which is worth, uh, again, reading. It's, it's just a different title. Um, this particular uh, volume looks only at the Second Sino-Japanese War, which dates from 1937 to 1945, or um, as contemporary Chinese historians write, 1931 to 1945. So they mark history very differently. Now, Radometer looks at, again, the brutality of Japan's invasion, but also reflects upon how uh, China has been very proactive in rewriting um, the history of the Second Sino-Japanese War to include themes such as China working alongside the Allies to uh, defeat not only Japanese fascism at home, but to resist Japanese or uh, uh, global fascism, uh, including the Nazis, the Italians, and the Japanese. Um, Rana points out that the Chinese government, uh, the Com Chinese Communist Party of, of China, is very proactive in trying to redefine um, how um, uh, China participated in the war with Japan, um, its critical uh, 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 contributions to uh, promoting a, a new international system that was forged from 1945 onward, and trying to promote this idea of uh, China's good war in that it worked uh, and sacrificed tremendous resources in battling Japan and the, um, it, Japan's imperial army uh, for broader um, for the broader defeat of fascism. Uh, this narrative is becoming uh, very very popular within the Chinese context, and we saw back in 2015 when uh, the uh, Chinese government celebrated the 75th anniversary of the end of, of World War II. They highlighted. Um, this new narrative of China's war uh, against Japanese fascism and global fascism. So this particular um, uh, book, again, highlights how different countries are proactively thinking about um, the wartime experience, how they uh, worked, uh, and how they, uh, the party in particular, uh, cont contributed to building uh, today's China, but also defeating uh, global fascism. Now, the challenges with this narrative, and it's not uh, uh, nothing wrong with uh, Rana Mitter's scholarship, and as he points out, is the narrative is somewhat uh, problematic. Um, the CCP uh, downplays the contributions of the nationalists and uh, pushing back against the Chinese or the Japanese. Um, they downplay the fact that the, the communists really sat out most of the uh, the war with the Japanese, um, uh, allowing for the Japanese and the, the nationalists to fight each other and to weaken the nationalists for uh, a, a eventual civil war between the nationalists and the, um, the communists in, in China. Um, the book also, again, uh, tries to rewrite how uh, China's uh, fight with Japan was part of a global effort against um, uh, totalitarianism and um, imperialism. Uh, and again, this is a really, really interesting way to be thinking about history and thinking of how proactive our Chinese uh, friends are in trying to reconceptualize how we think about um, the Japanese invasion and how this was related to uh, China being on the side of the allies in terms of uh, uh, producing and building today's contemporary world order. Uh, the last book that I want to touch upon is by Richard McGregor. Now, Richard McGregor is a journalist, um, and he used to work for the FT, and uh, and uh, spent many, many years in Beijing, but also in Japan. So his deep experience in both of these countries as a journalist, uh, understanding some of the major players and thinking about how uh, these countries have interacted over many decades. Today, Richard is part of the Lowy Institute in Australia, and he spearheads their uh, China program. And he's written some very, very interesting books, including uh, The Party, which is about uh, the Communist Party of China, uh, and Asia's Reckoning, this particular book, as well as a new volume on Xi Jinping. Now, what's interesting about Mitch, Richard McGregor's uh, take in his Asian Reckonings book is he talks about the tri 
multilateral relationship between China, Japan, and the United States, and how this is related to the fate of the uh, of the Asia Pacific um, when he wrote this book, or the Indo Pacific today. And he highlights the challenges of uh, first the bilateral relationship between China and Japan, um, but also the trilateral uh, challenges between the three countries. Um, in this particular book, he provides some real, I think, nuggets for um, people that are interested in the bilateral and trilateral relationship, highlighting that um, in the initial normalization uh, negotiations between Japan and China, the Chinese decided to not request uh, war reparations from the Japanese. Uh, he includes quotes from Mao Zedong telling Tanaka Kakue that uh, when Takanaka Kakue was apologizing for Japan's imperial period, that uh, Mao said that you know, there's nothing to apologize. If it wasn't for the Japanese, the uh, Communist Party would not have defeated uh, the nationalists and they wouldn't be in power today and they wouldn't be working together. Um, he highlights that the relationship between China and Japan uh, has always been a complicated one, but one that was primarily negotiated through party to party relations. Um, and as we know, China is a one-party state, but for much of Japan's contemporary post-World War II period, uh, history, um, it has largely been dominated by the LDP. And it's this party-to-party -party relationship that has brought stability to really the first 50 or 60 years of bilateral relations, where problems, uh, opportunities, and how the two states engaged were negotiated through uh, middlemen or middle people in contemporary uh, uh, culturally appropriate words, would try to find opportunities to, again, deal with the challenges in the relationship. Now, um, in contemporary times, uh, you've probably heard of Nikkei uh, Toshihiro, uh, who is really uh, one of the those important individuals that uh, acts as a middle person between the two countries. Uh, he is relatively pro-engagement with China. That doesn't mean pro-China or pro-CCP. It means pro-engagement. Um, and uh, he often uh, during uh, and post uh, pre-COVID visited China to try and stabilize relations. And um, he used his party to party uh, relationships and knowledge of the key players to try and stabilize relations. Um, McGregor also talks about the complicated nature of diplomacy between these two states, where um, China in the 1980s or beginning in the 1980s uh, and the political elite saw the utility of using uh, anti-Japanese propaganda uh, to consolidate um, political uh, power within the Chinese context. We saw this first in 1986 when Deng Xiaoping, the second generation leader, uh, had to court the PLA and um, uh, anti-Japanese uh, uh, factions within the Chinese political sphere in order to consolidate his rule within the, the Communist Party of China. And since that time, what we've seen regularly is when we have a new leader that comes into power, whether it's Deng Xiaoping or Jiang Zemin or Hu Jintao or now Xi Jinping, that we see a, an upturn in anti-Japanese sentiment as a way to consolidate political power within these states. Now, Richard also points out that uh, there was always a complicated relationship between the three countries in that Japan was um, at first very much pro-China engagement uh, and the United States came really late to the game. Uh, and then as Japan became more wary of China's uh, assertive behavior in, the, in its backyard, we saw Japan uh, sending signal to the United States that there could be some concern. Um, we saw Japan was the first country to re-engage with China after the Tiananmen Square massacre or incident in 1989 on June 4th. Uh, and eventually uh, Japan became the leading state to advocate for a more, more assertive uh, and clear-eyed mind, a clear-eyed approach to uh, managing its bilateral relations with China. So this last book really, again, focuses on the trilateral relationship, which I, which I think is very, very important in terms of um, how these three states are engaging with each other. And this relationship has become even more important today. Uh, and Richard's book is, is somewhat dated, but today uh, the United States and Japan are working uh, side by side and at a deeper level, not only in terms of defense cooperation and security cooperation within the region, but also um, you know, harmonizing economic policy and most recently um, 
finding ways to cooperate in terms of semiconductor manufacturing uh, by working between the United States, Taiwan, <coughs> South Korea, and the, and the Netherlands. So we see that this trilateral relationship continues to be very, very important. Um, at the same time, uh, Japan's biggest trading partner is China at $391 billion last year. And that trade relationship will continue to be important as Japan tries to maintain uh, a sustainable uh, economic trajectory moving forward. Next slide, please. So as we think about these four books, um, really we can uh, sum them up. I think the slide's coming. Good. Uh, that Ezra Vogel talks about um, Japan, China as students and teachers where they once were, you know, each country was once a student, but today they need to be teaching each other of how to solve problems, how to be more dynamic, how to be more flexible, uh, and how to, again, face history in a way that they can um, start to produce and, and coexist together in a more uh, productive way. Um, the second book by uh, Dreyer, again, talks about rivalry and selective engagement on both sides. And I think that uh, this particular narrative is very true and continues to be true uh, as um, Sino-Japanese relations become more uh, stressed. Uh, Mitter's book, again, The Role of Japan in Modern Chinese Identity. And again, as many political leaders would say, there'd be no modern China without the Japanese invasion. And I think this is really, really uh, critical. And um, it's something that not only I think the Chinese understand, uh, but that's the Koreans as well. And lastly, um, Asia's Reckoning um, by Rich McGregor, focusing on trilateral relations. Now, I promised that I make mention of uh, the late Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. And I think that um, leftist interpretations of Prime Minister Abe are, are very critical of him. Uh, they often call him uh, conservative, somebody that's interested in remilitarizing Japan, and someone that was uh, unapologetically um, a historical revisionist. Um, I think that these interpretations are problematic. Um, it was Prime Minister Abe during his second term as Prime Minister that uh, forged a path to normalizing bilateral relations with Xi Jinping's China. Uh, this uh, took time after the uh, DPJ, the Democratic Party of Japan, uh, had many challenges in terms of their relationship with China, eventually nationalizing the Senkaku Islands, which uh, created uh, almost five years of very disruptive bilateral relations. Uh, Prime Minister Abe visited uh, to, uh, Beijing in 2019, um, signed 55 uh, memorandums of understanding for third party uh, uh, or third country infrastructure cooperation as a platform for engaging in bilateral relations to um, find ways to shape uh, the BRI from within and find ways to engage with China. China. Um, if it wasn't for COVID in March 2020, Xi Jinping would have visited uh, Japan for a cherry blossom uh, party um, and they would have likely signed a fifth political document that would have charted the next 10 years of bilateral relations. So Prime Minister Abe, rather than being uh, militaristic and a conservative, was somebody that was steeped in realism in understanding that the relationship with China could not be divorced, that in order for Japan to have a uh, positive relationship moving forward, that it needed to engage with China, find ways to uh, trade with China. And he did that by promoting the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, by uh, promoting the, uh, the TPP within the region, which does not include China. Um, at the same time, uh, thinking about resilience in the economy and building other partnerships, uh, such as such as the Japan EU uh, uh, Economic Partnership Agreement, and he also invested in deterrence. So Prime Minister Abe's legacy is with us today, and we see this uh, not only not only in uh, uh, Prime Minister Suga's foreign policy, but also Prime Minister Kishida's foreign policy, and the new national security strategy that was released in uh, late 2022, which uh, focuses on defense which highlights the challenge that China faces for, uh, for uh, Japan, um, but also the importance of cooperating. And again, this new national security strategy that Prime Minister Abe, I think was influential uh, in uh, his passing and shaping uh, really touches upon the importance of engagement, 
resilience and deterrence. So with that, I'm going to stop there and open up the floor to Q&A from um, all of you. Uh, I do encourage you to um, share your name and uh, be succinct in your Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nagy, for your wonderful presentation. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, so to begin, I would like to ask a question of myself. Um, so as the tensions in Taiwan increases, um, how do you think Japan will be able or can maintain good relations with China considering the difficult relationship uh, between China and the US and then kind of Japan kind of being in the middle of that? So Amani, that's a great question. And I, I think it's really important for us to think about the economic relationship between the two states. Um, as I mentioned last year, about $291 billion of bilateral trade. It's by and large equal. That means the Chinese are selling as much as they're buying. Um, and this means that it's a tremendous asset to the Japanese economy moving forward. Uh, Japan has a demographic uh, demographic challenges moving forward. Um, there's still most of the markets that Japan is part of, Europe, North America, are largely um, saturated and developed. And um, in order for Japan to, again, continue to grow and be sustainable, it must engage in China. So I don't see this equation changing. How I see the, enga the engagement with China changing is that you know, we'll see some selective diversification away from China in sensitive sectors, such as the semiconductor field, medical equipment, uh, and dual use technologies, and that uh, uh, Japan will work with other countries to try and increase um, uh, markets there. Um, on the Taiwanese question, Taiwan, uh, Taiwan is very important for Japanese security. Um, we've seen that statement um, by the former Prime Minister Suga when he visited the White House uh, in March 2021. Uh, and we've seen a continued uh, line of uh, statements by Japan and bilateral apartments, uh, 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 partners, as well as in multilateral frameworks of the importance of this relationship. Uh, so I think that Japan is going to try and uh, promote peace and stability across the Taiwan Straits. That means the status quo. Uh, but at the same time, they're going to try and uh, inculcate Taiwan into as many uh, non-state relationships as possible to build stability into that relationship. Uh, and at the same time, communicate to Beijing that Japan supports a one-China policy and that any uh, future path for Taiwan-China must be through uh, peaceful means uh, rather than a forced reunification. I see. So with regards to um, economic uh, relations or um, trade between China and Japan, if things were to escalate, do you think that Japan would be able to find a sustainable way of perhaps getting its resources elsewhere if, let's say, the relation, the economic or the trading relationship between Japan and China uh, collapsed uh, due to the escalation uh, towards maybe some type of, I don't know, um, some something happening in Taiwan. Say. So I, I, I get your question. Um, and I think that we should be very clear that China still has many comparative advantages in terms of being what we call the global production network. So the large majority of the products that we use in everyday life, and that includes our iPad that we're using right now, our Apple products, um, many things, probably the chairs that we're sitting on are made in China. So if China is no longer building those things, the cost of all that was going to double, triple, quadruple, quintuple. So uh, this would have global economic um, repercussions. So I think that uh, Japan, but also South Korea, Australia, Southeast Asian countries and even the United States um, want to find uh, a new balance with China. This does not mean decoupling, but it certainly means selective diversification in particular industries. So to use a, a metaphor, it's they want to have their cake and eat it too. Uh, 
And I think that China as well would like to have their cake and eat it too. They want access to uh, big markets. They want access to technologies. They want access to um, universities and great education abroad. Um, at the same time, they want to protect their economy from economic coercion and um, the pressure that they're feeling right now. So these pressures that you're talking about are not just on the Japan side, it's on the China side as well, but also in all the countries that surround China. They have similar dynamics in terms of thinking about that, this critical bilateral relationship. Thank you so much. Um, the next question comes from uh, Hiroaki uh, Nakanishi uh, asks, what is the role of Japan in stabilizing the Indo-Pacific security and economy trade? How can Japan play a bridge building role between the US and China? Well, Japan is uh, one of the biggest uh, investors in Southeast Asia. As we know that Japan under Prime Minister Abe put forth the concept of the free and open Indo-Pacific vision, which has now been adopted by ASEAN, Canada, the United States, uh, Germany, the EU, France, the UK, South Korea, uh, and others. Uh, so this Indo-Pacific framing uh, stresses a rules-based order. It, stresses institution building in the Indo-Pacific region. It stresses shared norms. It stresses uh, infrastructure connectivity building. And again, creating a critical mass of countries that behave in the same way uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. Now, this is meant to balance China's size and growth, but also create a, a mass of countries that are all behaving the same way. And I think that Japan's leadership in terms of financing, its leadership in terms of diplomacy, uh, and its long-term uh, positive reputation within the broader region gives it uh, a, a larger than life uh, role in uh, creating a, a framework that other countries can engage within the region. Um, at the same time, we see Japan uh, not uh, saying no to its relationship with China. It views China as uh, a, an economy and a, a country that they must engage with in order to be sustainable. The question is, is you know, how do they shape Chinese behavior uh, over the years to come? And what Japan is hoping is that they'll be able to, again, um, uh, build resilience into their economy through these diplomatic initiatives in the Indo-Pacific um, that will uh, buffer or insulate them from some of the challenges associated with the Chinese relationship, but at the same time continue to uh, engage with China through trade, through environmental cooperation, uh, through non-traditional security uh, cooperate, cooperation, such as transnational diseases. Thank you. Um, the next question comes from Lin Ha. Um, ask, how is education influencing the attitudes of Chinese and Japanese students towards the relationship between their two countries? From your teaching experience, how do you think teachers can ensure that they present a fair and objective view of China-Japan relations to their students, given the complex historical and political issues involved? Thank you very much, Lynn. It's good to uh, hear from you. This is a great question. And I think that um, history education in both countries is highly problematic. Um, in the Japanese context, really, there's not enough um, high quality uh, uh, teaching about um, Sino-Japanese relations within the modern context. And here I'm talking about from the Meiji Restoration to the end of World War II. Uh, about Japan's uh, first Sino-Japanese War, the second Sino-Japanese War, and of course some of the um, uh, the uh, very uh, awful um, treatment of the Chinese, such as the Nanjing Massacre or um, uh, the Unit 371. Uh, so I think there's many uh, problems in the Japanese education system but it's not uniform. Uh, so at my university, we speak very frankly about these issues. Uh, in the Chinese context, um, really there's only one narrative and that's the narrative of the party. And right now the narrative of the party really focuses on Japan as, as um, you know, uh, a victimizer um, and avoids a lot of the challenge, in inconvenient truths associated with the, the party itself. So I think um, in both countries, it's challenging. Um, 
the way that I tried to deal with it is I used to bring students to China and they would talk to their Chinese counterparts and see things on the ground, talk to nationalists, talk to com uh, communists, talk to more liberal uh, people in China to get a broader sense. And I think that we need to do the same with our Chinese students is bring them to countries like Japan or Canada to give them a broader set of understandings about um, the bilateral relationship, but also um, history in general. Uh, and I think that this will be critical. Uh, last thing, I think this is probably a feature of the education systems within the region, is that the nature of the um, exam system to get into university doesn't so much focus on critical thinking about history, rather it focuses on consuming, remembering, and being able to uh, put out a huge amount of information for entrance exams. So I think that the education systems are not training uh, people to engage in history critically. Uh, and I think that this is uh, uh, something that we need to uh, focus on. Lastly, and I think importantly, Lynn, is that, um, and there's a great new paper by Hai Guo in uh, um, Asian Society, if you do have a chance to read it, and she talks about history being instrumentalized in both countries for nationalist purposes. And this is uh, means that the governments are not necessarily interested in addressing history forthrightly um, because it, it really is not in their current national interests. Uh, so it's a complicated answer, um, but I, I will continue to try and, and share as much as I can uh, to Chinese and Japanese students about uh, the history of the region. Uh, so Dr. Nagy, so to kind of um, add to that uh, question and, um, and what you said, um, I've heard that in some instances when um, maybe some Chinese students have gone to the U.S. or have come to Japan, that sometimes they have challenged the narrative that's being shared by those professors about the relationships between, like, let's say, the U.S. and China or China and Japan. So in those situations where there is this, um, you know, this, this competition between I idealisms, you know, what's being taught in the West versus what is being taught in China, how do you think that professors are able to kind of create a classroom that's respectful of different belief systems when it comes to these kinds of um, challenges, I guess. So I think that um, in the public space and in classrooms is a different, uh, it's, it's different. Uh, in democratic societies, all views are, are generally allowed to be expressed publicly, whether they are the right views or not. Uh, so I think that this is healthy, but not necessarily uh, productive. Um, in the classroom, though, I think that the opportunity for sharing is really important. Uh, and I think that um, when there are people of different backgrounds, and I'm not just thinking about the Japanese and the Chinese, but we can include Koreans or Southeast Asians or Africans or anybody, uh, it's important to allow for group um, work to share their views and always ask, why do you have that view? Uh, and a really good example of this is um, so we often hear uh, that the Chinese think that the Japanese have never apologized for their invasion. And this is frankly wrong um, because they have many, many times. But the question is, why do they have this view? And when you start to interrogate why they have this view, then you start to understand, oh, well, they've only gotten half the story. Uh, and then on the Japanese side as well, you know, you'll often hear that the Chinese only, from the Japanese, the Chinese only complain about Japan and they complain about us not uh, being honest about history. Um, and so their view is very biased as well. And the question is, why do they have that, that view? And then you interrogate them and well, they don't know many Chinese, they've never been to China, uh, they can't read and write Chinese. Um, and you know, their experience about China is primarily through the lens of, of media that is mostly negative about China. And again, when I brought students to China, um, they come back with much more nuanced views. And I think that engagement is incredibly important. And in the classroom, what professors can do is create the environment where people of different backgrounds share each other's understanding and keep asking the question of why. Why do you have that view? Why, why, is it, why are you thinking this way? 
and get them to explain it. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is from Vivian in Inji. Um, can you talk about the influence that the U.S. had on Japan's policy towards China over the years, especially about the changes from the 1970s till today? So hi, Vivian. It's great to hear from you. Thanks so much. So I think when we look at Japan's engagement with uh, China through the lens of its bilateral relationship with the United States. Well, first and foremost, we saw the United States uh, normalize relations with China, and they only informed the Japanese, I think, two hours before the actual announcement. So this was a shock. It was a shock for the Japanese because they found that their alliance partner was able to engage in this kind of diplomacy um, behind their back. So it started to it pushed Japan to be, I think, more proactive of how to engage with China. Um, we saw the United States, uh, again, normalizing uh, its relations with China, but primarily for the geopolitical context. And what we saw is Japan, once that happened, was able to start engaging economically with China through first inter intergovernmental loans to help build infrastructure connectivity, and then through FDI, so foreign de development, uh, foreign direct investment, to try and build a new manufacturing network uh, center there. So really the 1970s and 1980s, we didn't see um, China as a major threat. We saw China as a partner of Japan and the United States in terms of uh, out competing the Soviet Union. In the 1990s, after the Tiananmen Square massacre and after a nuclear test by the Chinese in the Gobi Desert in 1994, 1995, and more assertive behavior across the Taiwan Straits, here we start to see uh, the Chinese, the Japanese to take a more alarmist approach or a more uh, concerned approach about <coughs> the direction that China is going and talking to Japan, uh, to the United States about that. And in the, in the post-Cold War period with the collapse of the Soviet Union, we saw the United States start to um, uh, rethink its footprint within the region, rethink the uh, raison d'etre, the reason for being of the um, Japan uh, uh, US alliance. And I think that they started to um, ask the Japanese to enhance the cooperative cooperation with the alliance. So it usually means the geographic area that they could cooperate in, but also the kinds of activities that they could engage in. So what we've seen since the 1990s, usually at the uh, pressure of the United States, it's a gradual incremental increase in the geographic scope of U uh, Japan's activities, uh, self-defense activities, but also the qualitative nature of the kinds of activities it can engage in. And I think the pinnacle is what we've seen in the national security strategy is that Japan has now um, uh, decided to acquire counter-strike capabilities, uh, but also enhance its deterrence uh, within the region broadly and increase its burden up within the US-Japan alliance uh, to really, um, again, help with the tremendous burden of a secure US-based security architecture within the region. And again, the US has been instrumental uh, because of its initial engagement with China, because of its um, interest in ensuring that allies increase their share of the burden for their security, um, but also the demands of China because of its fast growing economy, because of its rapid militarization, um, the reality is that um, the U.S. can't do it alone anymore. So I think the U.S. has been extremely important in shaping um, uh, Japan's behavior towards China. But I want to bring a caveat. It was the Japanese that helped moderate the Trump administration's engagement with um, on China. And we still see a very important role of Japan in trying to create a less securitized U.S.-China dynamic um, stressing the importance of um, engagement, not just a securitized relationship. Thank you. Um, so the next question comes from Mark Oroka. Uh, what kind of sacrifices has Japan made in cooperating with China and Taiwan? Uh, what kind of sacrifices? So uh, I'm trying to uh, maybe drill down into this mark a little bit more. So on the Chinese front, I think, you know, Japan has invested a tremendous amount of economic resources into building a relationship with China. 
Uh, and it's not always been good. You know, we have anti-Japanese, we had anti-Japanese riots in 2010 and 2012. And this has been a challenge for the Japanese economy. I think really uh, up until 2010, the Japanese have, um, they didn't really push back against some of the uh, criticism the Chinese had of Japan, Japanese history and, and the constant belittling of Japan uh prioritizing its economic relationships um i think that uh, japan continues to see um, um deprioritizing leadership within the region and working within uh with asean what we call asean plus three so to see asean countries plus south korea china and japan as uh, a way to promote regional integration and that the three uh, difficult dynamics between south korea japan and china uh, don't become uh, an obstacle to regional integration. Uh, and this is why they uh, deprioritized deprioritize their leadership. So I think these are some good examples in terms of uh, the sacrifices Japan has made in terms of cooperating with the Chinese. And I think that this will continue um, moving forward. On Taiwan, uh, Taiwan is, um, I guess the sacrifice for cooperation with the Taiwanese is not recognizing it as a, a state. Um, and not having the kind of relationship that you want to have with Taiwan. Um, the Japanese have tremendously good relations with the Taiwanese people and the Taiwanese government. However, the one China policy uh, really is the framework by which uh, Japan engages with Taiwan. And by the way, many countries engage with Taiwan. So, you know, they are sacrificing what they really would like, which is a bit much deeper bilateral relations with Taiwan for broader stability between um, Taiwan, China, and uh, Japan, uh, based on the one China uh, policy. Thank you. Uh, Georgi um, Masa Masahibile, my apologies if I mispronounce your name, um, asked, uh, will Japan be able to balance China in terms of military with new NSS and defense strategy, or do they, meaning Japan, still need stronger military um, our defensive measures. So thank you very much. So um, that's a great question. Uh, last year, the Chinese spent about $229 billion in their military. This is uh, what we know. I think most, most estimates by analysts expect it to be more than that. Uh, the Japanese spent about $56 billion. So even if the Japanese are successful in doubling their military budget in five years to about $120 billion, that's still going to be much smaller, not even half of what the Chinese are engaged in. So based on that data, I don't think Japan can balance the, the Chinese, uh, you know, one on one. Uh, and this is why Japan is choosing to join many multilateral organizations and mini lateral organizations, such as the Quad, the Japan EU Economic Partnership Agreement, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, building reciprocal access agreements with Australia and the UK, um, having a six-point uh, action plan with Canada in the, in the Pacific, uh, deepening its alliance with the United States, uh, as well as increasing some of its defensive capabilities, such as counter-strike capability. It's the firm belief, in my understanding of Japan, the best way to secure its relationship with China is through engagement, through trade, through environmental cooperation in any possible way, building res 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 resilience into the relationship, such as selectively diversifying supply chains uh, and building many, many economic partners. Um, and then that deterrent side, again, working with like-minded countries to deter uh, assertive behavior in the Sea of, uh, in, in, um, uh, the sea of Japan, in around Senkaku Islands, across the Taiwan Strait, or in the South China Sea. Uh, it's a very broad strategy, which um, security, hard security tools is, is important, but I don't think should be the primary lens of how Japan is trying to balance its relationship with China. Thank you so much. Um, the next question comes from Governor Sifrini, um, asks, can we look at Japan-China relations per se, or will they always be a subset of the U.S.-China relations? So thank you, Gabor. Uh, um, it's good to hear from you. So I think that um, we can look at the bilateral relations between Japan and China um, by themselves, 
but it's also useful to look at the trilateral relationship between um, the US, China, and the United States. And as I mentioned, I think that it is a, a, it is a, it is a mistake to think that you know, uh, Japan does not have strategic autonomy with regards to its security policy, and that sometimes the, the Japanese are, are shaping US policy in terms of moderating US policy, in terms of getting it to think more smartly about Indo-Pacific engagement, trying to move it away from primarily security, you know, uh, number of Navy boats and submarines and guns and soldiers in the region, to thinking about economic engagement, thinking about development engagement, thinking about building infrastructure and connectivity, thinking about enhancing diplomatic engagement within the region. Now, the quadrilateral security dialogue is a very good example of this. In 2005, when it emerged as an important um, tool to put to help with the rebuilding after the uh, Indian tsunami, um, we've seen the Quad move from a primary security focused organization to one that's engaged in public good provision. I think that this has been partly because of Japan's internal pressure within the Quad, working with India, saying that, hey, security is important. But all this other stuff is really, really important in shaping the region and shaping um, uh, how China will engage within the region. And with that, I think that Japan can be seen um, uh, as an important um, leader or influencer of US foreign policy. Now, can Japan and China be isolated? Yes. And again, I think looking at Prime Minister Abe's um, efforts to sign a fifth political document this was you know not linked to u.s policy it was about thinking of how they can chart a path forward between japan and xi jinping's china uh, and i think that there are still many opportunities uh, because of japan's significant economic footprint in china that the relationship between china and japan is not uh, one where china, uh, japan is dependent on china rather both countries are dependent on each other meaning that Japan can influence China's behavior uh, domestically through smart policy choices. So uh, my answer again, in short, is yes and no. Um, I think that we can separate it, um, but at other times we can't separate it. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is from Amit Nufil. Um, he, uh, they, they ask, um, or they comment first, there would be no modern China without the US acting on behalf of globalists and creating the current China. Um, so the recent current China was set up by Kin Kissinger and Nixon in 1972, which led to shifting of manufacturing from the West to China. Is there a discussion in Japan on these facts? So I, I agree with you, Ahmed, Ahmed um, that uh, the United States opened the doors to uh, opening up China. Um, but it was Japan from the 1970s, really until the 19, mid 1990s, 2000s, that created uh, the manufacturing powerhouse through um, overseas development assistance and foreign direct investment in China. Uh, and this is why we see $391 billion of bilateral trade, despite both countries not liking each other and record unfavorable ratings in the COVID 19 pandemic. Um, so I think that Japan recognizes the U.S. role. Uh, the U.S. opened the door and the, uh, the Japanese moved in and again tried to uh, find economic opportunity as their economy was looking for uh, labor resources and other resources to become a manufacturing superpower in the 1970s and 1980s and 1990s. And that role is still important today. Um, would they do it differently today? That's a really interesting question. I think um, in hindsight, uh, I think the choices to open up our doors to China um, could have been done slightly differently, um, but I think it broadly it was the right choice. Um, and so the next question comes from um, John Mincing. How do you think the Jingo incident contributed to the 18? 95 war. Uh, I'm going to take a pass on that one uh, because I doesn't I I, I'm, I I don't recall the incident. My apologies. Um, so I guess this will probably be maybe the last question. But LTJG Baptiste 
uh, asks, uh, do you have insight into how Deng Xiaoping and his role in modernizing China is represented in teaching Chinese history in China? So I think that um, Deng Xiaoping was the second generation leader um, and he advocated for something called reform and opening up in the late 1970s. And the reform and opening up really meant that uh, they would reform administration so that the economy would work better and opening up meant that they would open up the Chinese economy selectively to the outside world so they could learn and trade and produce things to, to abroad. Uh, the reform and opening up has nothing to do with democratization or liberalizing the economy. Uh, and I think that is a really, really uh, important take home message when you are reading about the reform and opening up process. Um, and when we learn about the reform and opening up process within the Chinese context, really it's talking about, again, the important reform, administrative reforms that allowed the Chinese economy to work better uh, and the selective opening that allowed for um, foreign businesses to invest in China selectively uh, so that they could produce the manufacturing superpower that allowed the Chinese government really to move 600 million people out of utter poverty into um, either the middle class or away from poverty. And this has been, I think, an incredible achievement, but the achievement couldn't have taken place without um, the reform and opening up and allowing Chinese citizens to work and do what they do well, make money, but also the important investments from neighboring countries such as Japan and Korea and China or the United States. Um, and the Chinese learned about Deng Xiaoping, but today I think his role is being diminished as uh, Xi Jinping thought uh, has become much more central in terms of uh, creating uh, ideological cohesion amongst Chinese citizens uh, that's based on a commitment to Marxist-Leninism, so strong state engagement in the economy, strong party representation in all organizations uh, in society, and a very strong nationalist um, sentiment based on this uh, desire to achieve the China dream. Uh, but also a strong sense of victimhood and humiliation based on their interpretation of 100 years of humiliation. Thank you so much, Dr. Nadi. Um, so I guess uh, that would probably be the last question, but I want to say thank you everyone for the amazing questions. So sorry if we couldn't get to every question. Um, and again, um, we appreciate everyone for asking questions and Dr. Nagy, thank you so much for taking the time to answer all of them. Uh, we really appreciate you being here today and taking time out of your day to be with us. Um, before we end, um, I would like to share some upcoming events, if I may. Um, but before I do that, I also want to thank our program sponsor, the Japan Foundation New York. For events. So tomorrow we have another webinar um, that is going to be from the Indo-Pacific Dialogue. It is going to be on AUKUS in the Indo-Pacific and Tom Corbin will be the speaker for that. And um, Dr. Nagy will also be uh, moderating that as well. So if you have time tomorrow, please join us. Um, same time, 10 a.m. Uh, Japan Standard Time uh, for the uh, webinar on AUKUS in the Indo-Pacific. Next event, please. The next Getting to Know Japan webinar will be on the culture of Edo. It will be on August 22nd, Tuesday, August 22nd at 10 a.m. Professor William Fleming will be the speaker for that event. Um, and so if you have time, I realize this is a, a couple weeks away, but please join us on Tuesday, uh, August 22nd for the culture of Edo uh, for the next Getting to Know Japan webinar. And uh, registration information will be coming soon. Next event, please. So uh, we have an ongoing um, initiative. Um, YCAPS Mongolia Connect program is partnering with a range of partners to deliver 166 adjustable all-terrain wheelchairs to disabled children in the Mongolian countryside. Um, so demonstrating this as an act of love and labor, YCAPS Mongolian Connect director Nick Millward will be partnering with an Australian and Mongolian to conduct a 24-hour rowathon from uh, July 29th, 8, 8 a.m. till July 
30th, 8 a.m., so a full 24 hours. They will be rowing uh, machines outside of Anytime Fitness in East Brisbane. Um, so we encourage everyone, if you have uh, the opportunity to jump on the rowers and struggle alongside them, but if you don't have the time um, and you would like to contribute in a, in a different way, we ask you to kindly donate. Um, on the screen, you will see a uh, QR code. That QR code will take you to uh, the page where you can um, donate um, and um, purchase a wheelchair for a child. It is $35. Um, so we kindly ask you to uh, contribute if you are able. Um, and the last, um, the last thing I want to mention is YCAPS and uh, finally has a YouTube channel. If you didn't know, um, it launched over the weekend. So um, if you would like to be able to watch all webinars from August 2023 until now, um, you will find it on our YouTube channel. So um, in addition to getting to know Japan webinars, we also have um, webinars from various other programs within YCAPS and some other YCAPS content. So um, please subscribe, please like our videos, and please return weekly to see what webinars and what other YCAPS content will be uploaded. So once again, we thank you everyone for joining us today, and um, we thank you for your questions and kind contributions. Dr. Nagy, thank you so much once again for your time today. We hope to see everyone here again on August 22nd and to join us tomorrow for um, the webinar that uh, about AUKUS and the Indo-Pacific. Have a nice rest of your day, morning, wherever you are dialing in from, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Look forward to seeing you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.